that's kind of how a lot of athletes will get roped into uh, drug abuse and narcotic abuse, uh, essentially off of uh, good intentions by teammates to by sharing their medicines with them. And I was not alone in this. So I had chronic pain. Uh, I took it once. It did help my pain, but I realized that's not an option. You know, there's conventional therapies for this. If you look on up to date, um, they say it's a disease of the novice tennis player, but I'm far from a novice. And so none of this really made any sense to me. I did all this, the stretches, the ices, the ibuprofen. It just didn't get better, right? So that led me to some deeper, deeper searching. And I came across the ancestral diet. And lo and behold, it fixed my tennis elbow. And the deeper I went into this, the more I understood that uh, it can potentially treat all kinds of diseases, right? You, more energy for patients, uh, more resilience to disease, less inflammation, at least in my case, through lateral epicondylitis, I could attest to that. We go deeper into it. We see prevention of sarcopenia, osteoporosis, age-related disorders, right? Reversal of diabetes and, uh, and obesity. So let's talk a little bit about this. Um, I don't know why there's writing all over my screen. <laughs> Your toxic bucket is full, right? So oils and additives to avoid so these would be your soybean oil, uh, cottonseed oil, rice grain oil, a lot of these industrial uh, oils that are highly oxidized, right? So when I tell my patients about the ancestral diets, think about, you know, maybe how we evolved, would your, would your ancestors have been eating uh, corn oil and soybean oil? Uh, no, most likely not. These are very difficult to synthesize, and we just wouldn't have evolved with these. Um, so that's what I kind of teach my patients about, but let's go a little bit into a deeper detail on these vegetable oils and seed oils. Uh, there's a lot of discussion in the, in the literature about this, of uh, the balance between omega threes and omega sixes. You can actually measure this in the blood on your patients and you can check it. Uh, they're kind of more expensive tests to do. So not everybody does that. And I don't order these routinely because my patient population, uh, typically, uh, you know, is, an average income, maybe even low income. So we're not ordering super expensive tests like these. So we basically go through their kitchen cabinet and we try to improve that ratio just by going through their kitchen fridge, right? We try to improve their omega-3s. What we see over the past uh, 100 years is a massive increase in uh, omega-6 oils and essentially these highly oxidized oils, right? These uh, corn oil and canola oils and soybean oils in particular. And we see over this time, uh, a kind of an increase in disease. Now we might say, hey, this is correlation, not causation. However, if we look at the farm industry, chicken farmers and beef farmers know this very well. If you wanna fatten up your animal, you feed it grains and you feed it uh, vegetable oils. This is well known to, at least in the farm industry, to increase the fat content of your animal. However, we haven't extrapolated this to humans yet as far as I've known in the, in the conventional literature. Uh, soybean oil, uh, safflower oil, this has a long history. This came back in the 1960s with the whole lot low fat uh, push. Uh, you guys maybe have been uh, uh, on the front lines of that back then. Uh, some of you all are a lot older than I in medicine. But you may have remembered back then the American Medical Association saying that safflower oil was healthier, um, this big push towards low fat is, um, uh, fats, right, and margarines. However, we really just saw that increase in disease over this time period, not an improvement in it. We can just, some of you back in the 80s and 70s, you probably didn't see the obesity that we just see nowadays, this metabolic dysfunction, it's just skyrocketing. And this in correlates with the amount of vegetable and seed oils, these processed industrial oils that have been consumed. Um, so again, you can look at charts on this of the omega-3 to omega-6 ratios instead of running expensive tests on your patients, right? So you can look at things like olive oil, uh, the content of omega-3s to omega-6s, uh, not too bad. But when we get down here, look at the safflower oil, look at soybean oil, right? So you have, you're in the 50,000 uh, milligram range of omega-6s here. And these aren't uh, regular omega-6s. These are oxidized, highly heated vegetable oils. So they're already... Uh, denatured and pro-inflammatory. Uh, but we can see the omega-3 to omega-6 balance is completely off here. And if you go through patients' cabinets, you will see they're consuming cottonseed oil. They were consuming uh, corn oil. They're sometimes cooking with it and thinking it's a healthy thing. 
uh, but the ratio will be completely off. Uh, but then I, I get this, but wait, you can't tell patients to eat saturated fats. That's, that's, that's clearly bad for you, right? Well, uh, not so much. And even the American College of Cardiology is coming on board. And this can, didn't get a lot of recognition. This came out in 2020 in the middle of the pandemic. But the ACC came out and said that they perhaps been wrong about the whole saturated fat theory. And that perhaps it's uh, LDL size, the particles, um, these ratios that are a little bit more important. And even the Brits are onto this as well. The Brits state in the British Medical Journal in 2017 that saturated fat does not clog arteries. Coronary heart disease is a chronic inflammatory condition, the risk of which can be effectively reduced with healthy lifestyle interventions. But where is all this inflammation coming from? All right, so let's get a little bit deeper into that um, and the ancestral diet itself. So we have here uh, my, my fiance's beef liver pate recipe. We'll talk a little bit about organ meats and why they're important. Um, but essentially you can get a lot of your nutrients from foods. And with my patient population, that's very important because, again, we I work with a lot of low-income patients. They don't have money for expensive IV nutraceutical infusions, high-end uh, supplements, right? So we need to make sure that what they're eating gives them the right nutrients. And you can get this through the ancestral diet, which we'll show you in a little bit. Uh, and here's my point towards uh, calories in, calories out is a little bit oversimplified. Uh, where I focus more on nutrient density per calorie and the satiety effect that certain foods have, All right? You can see here on the right here, what about 197 grams of protein looks like. And for myself, I try to hit that uh, for the most part. Sometimes I can't, but I try to hit about at least one gram per pound of body weight, um, that's minimum. But if you're trying to gain muscle mass, at least 1.5 grams per pound of body weight uh, up, to, um, up to even two for some bodybuilders. But essentially what this will do is it'll create satiety for your patients, right? So we use semaglutide, these ozempic medicines, what do they do, right? They enhance satiety, but you can do the similar effect by protein leveraging, right? This is a term that bodybuilders are very well aware of is you increase the amount of protein per calories that you're consuming to enhance satiety for weight loss, right? But in the, even in the literature, so my, my friends in the low carb community, um, they call it low carb, high fat diets, right? So they, we have a little bit more literature on these than the ancestral diet, uh, but these are very helpful for reversing metabolic dysfunction. And uh, this is pretty well established in the literature for metabolic disease, uh, type two diabetes, and weight loss. I like this uh, study a lot. Dietary carbohydrate restriction improves metabolic syndrome independent of weight loss. Again, because we, we hear so often in the fitness community and in health uh, weight loss clinics that it's all calories in, calories out. But here is a very cool study um, identifying that you can improve metabolic syndrome uh, with a carbohydrate restriction independent of weight loss. So the scale's not moving, but other things are changing. We're improving the pattern of the lipid particles. Uh, the low carbohydrate diet increases LDL size with, if we remember what the American College of Cardiology said earlier, the LDL size is a little bit more important than just looking at the simple LDL cholesterol. Uh, we're improving the, uh, the phenotype, these pattern A, pattern B phenotypes. If you're ordering NMR lipoproteins, which um, I do pretty routinely on most patients, right? I, I pretty much never order a standard lipid panel. I'm always looking at the pattern of their lipid particles. And if these are improving, if their insulin sensitivity is improving here, which can be done with these diets. And then I hear oftentimes from my conventional colleagues that high protein diets are dangerous. So we have to address some of these concerns here. I like pointing out this one, the pro-heart trial, where we had essentially patients with heart failure and diabetes mellitus doing a higher protein diet. And uh, the, the conclusion of this study is that they lost fat, specifically around their midsection and on their organs, the visceral fat, which is conducive to cardiac disease, um, on the higher protein diet compared to the standard protein. And, and even here, this is they actually did kind of still low protein, in my opinion, like 30% protein. That's still low protein, in my opinion. But I guess uh, way more protein than what conventional practices are using in their heart failure and diabetic patients. 
So let's talk a bit about sarcopenia. This is uh, muscular wasting. You go to Walmart, you typically will see this in 92% uh, of the people going around through Walmart. They're hunched over on the carts. They're frail. Maybe they're in the go carts, the electric carts. This is muscular wasting replaced with fatty infiltration. Think about the Wagyu beef. You go to the butcher, you see a Wagyu beef. There's fat streaking in the muscle. This is metabolic dysfunction in the cow, but this is common in the human being as well. If you do MRI scans of your patients, you look at their quadriceps muscle. Heck, you can do it even with an ultrasound. You can look at their calf muscle and you can see, at least with the ultrasound, white, right? You can see that whiteness in the muscle and that's fatty infiltration of the muscle. But we can improve this with resistance training and a higher protein diet, right? We have to protein leverage. So let's talk a little bit about uh, this ancestral diet. Um, maybe we have to talk a little bit about a uh, vegan diet. This gets a lot of popularity um, also in the functional medicine community, a lot of push towards plant-based diets. Uh, unfortunately, plants provide a very low protein quality. Um, you do not convert, you don't get extract amino acids. They don't have carnitine. They don't have creatine. There's not a lot of B vitamins. And if you're not buying expensive uh, organic vegetables, regeneratively raised vegetables, you're not getting a lot of B vitamins uh, or any vitamins at all. Unfortunately, this is pushed a lot online in media and even in our A4M, our meetings. I see this all the time where the vegan and the, the plant base is being pushed, where if you're looking at the data on this, there's really not a whole lot of evidence that this, uh, you know, reverses metabolic syndrome. Does it prevent sarcopenia? You know, if we're focusing on myopically on LDL particles or, or liver or lowering cholesterol, sure, it'll lower cholesterol, but you know, if, if we're up to date on the latest literature on what causes heart disease, it's not cholesterol, okay? It's inflammation and it's the lipoprotein particles. I sometimes get this from patients and colleagues like, but isn't eating protein just for bodybuilders? No, let's talk about the aging muscle. Let's talk about sarcopenia, right? So skeletal muscle is a potential uh, immune regulator. Right, so muscle isn't just for bodybuilders. Eating protein isn't just for bodybuilders. We want to maintain muscle as much as we can throughout our our extended lifespan, so that we have a higher quality of life, so that we aren't frail and debilitated with fractures. And uh, in the go kart at Walmart at age uh, 70, 65, you see it younger and younger. Uh, this is sarcopenia for the most part, muscular wasting from low protein intake, uh, obviously low hormones, which we're uh, a huge fan of hormone optimization. Uh, but you think about it through the immune aspect, having higher muscle um, will improve your immune system as well. And there's a lot of mechanisms for why this happens. Let's talk about another point. Isn't eating uh, protein bad for your kidneys? I hear this all the time. Uh, no, it's only harmful in those with advanced chronic kidney disease. Then yes, potentially high protein diets could be uh, bad, but in the average population and, and even in your older population that have good preserved kidney function, no, it's actually uh, very important to get more protein into the diet. So what does my diet look like? What does this ancestral look like? Ancestral diet look like visually? Okay. Um, most of my calories are from protein. So I'd say about 70% of my calories are from protein. I do cycle fruits throughout the year. I typically will eat more fruit during the summertime. I do eat more fruit or higher glycemic foods in the middle of tennis tournaments. Sometimes even in between changeovers, I'll be eating fruit or even honey. Uh, I will be eating rice. So foods that are lower inflammatory. Uh, I'm a huge fan of dairy, uh, specifically raw dairy, which we'll get into in a little bit. Organ meats, so you can see here an example of a kidney in the top left corner and bone marrow. You can make your soups easily out of this. I'm not averse to plants. I just, I don't waste my money on uh, glyphosate ridden plants. We had a lecture previously here about the dangers of glyphosate. So if I'm not getting regeneratively grown or organic vegetables, I'm just skipping on them and eating uh, animal based foods. So again, further with my ancestral diet, uh, we consider foods that are neutral, like potatoes, rice, tubers, right? These, these are fine foods. Uh, we just get ideally a, a really quality source with those. 
um, and maybe soaking them, soaking rice overnight. Specifically, if you're going to soak, if you're going to use beans for protein, we want to make sure we're soaking these overnight, perhaps in a bit of uh, probiotics to help uh, break down these things a little bit so that they're easier to digest. But still, we find patients that can't tolerate these things either. Um, so let's talk a little bit about dairy because uh, we want to definitely differentiate the two types of dairy out there, right? Um, so lactose versus lactulose, right? We all know what lactose and, and lactulose are, but maybe I should describe it a little bit better. Lactulose is a prescription diarrheal agent, right? Uh, dairy in its raw form doesn't have lactulose in it. But the moment you superheat milk, when you pasteurize it, it converts lactose to lactulose. So suddenly, perhaps you have a patient that says, I'm lactose intolerant. I put this patient on a raw milk, and sure enough, this lactose intolerance doesn't exist. So did this patient really have lactose intolerance, or was it just intolerance to pasteurized dairy that had a high lactulose content? Now, in the advent of Walmart and ultra-high pasteurized milks, we have a very high concentration of lactulose. So it actually increases with the amount you pasteurize this. So we can actually get kind of a laxative effect from pasteurized dairy, uh, almost kind of like microdosing lactulose. I mean, no one would do that in their right mind, get prescription lactulose and put this in their drink every day. But that's essentially what we're doing when we're uh, giving patients pasteurized dairy. But the, besides the pasteurization process on the lactose to lactose conversion, you are damaging amino acids and proteins, right? You are damaging uh, these, these uh, amino acids that we think that we're getting, but perhaps not so much. For, uh, for example, lysine. Lysine is one amino acid that is antiviral, right? It prevents cold sores. This is degraded uh, to a large degree when you are pasteurizing and specifically ultra high temperature pasteurization of milk. It's called the Maillard reaction, and that's the browning of foods that you get with overheating them. Uh, lysine is lost by the Maillard reaction. Um, we have degrees here, if you're interested. I think 130 Celsius uh, by, for 290 seconds uh, blocks lysine in whole milk. All right, so we can destroy this. But let's talk about enzymes. There's perhaps you know, 50 enzymes I can think of off the top of my head that are also destroyed with the pasteurization process. So 50 Celsius, you already start to degrade them. 70 Celsius was just standard pasteurization process. You've destroyed most of your enzymes. And uh, we talked previously in this community about lactoferrin and its role in preventing or treating cancer. So even that one molecule, you can buy it on full scripts. It's kind of expensive, about 70 bucks. Uh, but, you know, lactoferrin has been gone from the diet from pretty much all civilized nations because of the pasteurization process, right? So again, we have to look at the increase of diseases, the increased cancer, the increased risk of all uh, diseases and autoimmune diseases. And we look at these enzymes like lactoferrin, which controls the immune system, is antiviral. Uh, it steals iron from bacterial love and pathogens and puts it into your own cells to prevent iron deficiency anemia. A lot of benefits towards going back more towards uh, um, and ancestral milk as well. And we can't talk about the ancestral diet without talking about NAD and red meat, okay? So we all know about NAD. It's the big uh, hot topic in anti-aging medicine, right? We got, um, you know, people doing IV infusions of this for treating the long COVID and for uh, reversing aging. It's a coenzyme involved in you know, 500, more than 500 enzymatic reactions in the body. But where can you find NAD? Well, my favorite source is red meats. I'm going to show you a chart in a little bit about uh, that. But you can get it. You can inject it. IV infusion. You can get, you know, David Sinclair's uh, brand there. Um, but you can get it from red meats. And you don't have to purchase expensive products so much, right? So we look at the uh, sources, the, high, the chart here on, on sources of uh, nicotinamide. Uh, we can get so much from red meat. A uh, little bit from chicken, fish kind of drops off, um, really not much to say at all about NAD in beans, wheat, uh, low quality rice, not much to say there about it, potato, soybean. So essentially red meat is going to be your main source of NAD. And, you know, again, vegans and 
a lot of calorie in, calorie out uh, proponents will say all protein is created equal. But if we look at even NAD, no, not all protein is created equal. All right. So it further points to the protocol that we're going to discuss here that potentially trigger uh, immune diseases. Uh, flour, we all know about the dangers of flour, but again, these plant-based milk options, uh, they're typically high in vegetable oils. You just pick up any of these, you'll typically see canola and or soybean oil. There's always that and or you do that slash between the canola and whatever comes after that. That's just um, the bottom line for these big companies. They're trying to find the cheapest ingredients out there and put it in your product to sell it to the consumer. They're not looking out for your health. They're not putting soybean oil in it because it's healthier for you. They're putting in it and or canola oil because it's cheaper. Okay. High fructose corn syrup, this is in pretty much all your, uh, your food products out there, at least the sweeter ones. A diabetes prevalence 20% greater in countries with higher availability of high fructose corn syrup uh, compared to countries with low availability. Um, you know, for, for children especially, they should not be consuming high fructose corn syrup. It goes right to their brains that um, makes them agitated. You can see the difference in children getting them off this stuff. Uh, gluten, we have to talk about that one. You know, a functionalist knows about this pretty well, how it opens up tight uh, junctions, breaks these down, causes leaky gut syndrome, um, increases uh, your autoimmune reactions. In my case, I'm very sensitive to gluten. Uh, my tennis elbow can come back like that. I can cause tennis elbow in myself with a combination of uh, bad bread products and hard tennis events. So uh, this is the first thing I get patients off of is we get them off uh, the gluten. We try to repair their gut and uh, see how they do. But let's talk about the nutrients in a couple of these uh, options out there for your patients. So we got mackerel here. We can see 112 grams, one filet of mackerel. We can see a decent amount of vitamin A, maybe 187 units, not bad. Um, it stands out more on uh, minerals like potassium, uh, a little bit of zinc, manganese. It has great amino acids, obviously, uh, but the omega-3 to omega-6 ratio is very good there. So we're getting 3,000 milligrams of omega-3s to only about 245 of omega-6. So that's a really good ratio there to help improve our patient's omega-3 to 6 ratio. Let's look at beef liver, kind of one of my favorite mul uh, multivitamins out there, right? So instead of you know, expensive Quicksilver Scientific B vitamin complex costs your patient $50 for a little bottle of that. You can get uh, beef liver. You can get this at Publix in the frozen section for a pound for about $6. And this can feed a family of four for about two weeks and getting plenty of minerals, right? And vitamins. So look at the top of the list here, vitamin A, 31,000 units of vitamin A. We know vitamin A, it, it improves eyesight. It improves the immune system, the treatment for measles, right? Uh, and I hear oftentimes in the functional community, oh, what about vitamin A toxicity? Well, this is very rare. It happened once in Arctic explorers who ate polar bear liver. liver. Moral of the story is don't eat polar bear liver. This doesn't happen in regular liver. Bison liver, uh, beef liver, chicken liver, this does not happen, right? You get selenium. Look at this. 52% of the daily value of selenium. We know thyroid uh, dysfunction is an epidemic as well. We can get our selenium here, okay? Uh, a little bit of the uh, phosphorus, magnesium, uh, retinol, um, all the amino acids again. Uh, and then I, I was at an A4M event and I asked uh, a doctor who, uh, he gave a lecture on how to treat some very difficult disease. And he had a supplement list that at the end of his lecture was this long. And I went up to this and I said, I asked him, I said, what are your thoughts on beef liver? I mean, you can get pretty much 90%, except like quercetin, which you were mentioning, you get 90% of what you were recommending as a supplement, which would cost the patient probably $500 a month from beef liver. You know what he said? He said, why would you eat the filter organ of uh, the animal? And so the quality of the animal matters a lot. And this is actually quite striking. When you feed and uh, when you put a cow in a barn and you feed it grains and you feed it uh, oils and, and soybean oils, what happens is that the liver becomes abscessed. It's such a huge problem in the farming industry that they're trying to develop a vaccine to prevent liver abscesses in cows because there's a lot of mortality associated with this. This is why a lot of cows will get antibiotics. Now, there's a whole pro a push for antibiotic free cows, but if you feed them junk, 
they're going to get sick. So usually what they'll do is they'll grass feed the cow year round. And at the end, they'll feed them a short course of grains and so forth to fatten them up, make them feed, make them taste better. But if you feed them this long term, they get abscess, they get sick. And this is what I see in, in patients uh, as well is a lot of abscesses, a lot of sickness. Um, you can think of them kind of like the feedlot cows, just eating junk and their by process, their meat is going to be junk. Their, their muscles are going to be junk. Their liver is going to be junk. So obviously you wouldn't eat a junk food cow's liver. You would try to get a grass fed, a farm raised, uh, pasture raised cow. You're going to get a high quality liver there, a spleen, a kidney, right? Um, so glyphosate is, uh, in Roundup, is used on plants, and it's a reason why I avoid uh, or, or I don't have such a strong recommendation for consuming a lot of plants. Again, a lot of my patients are low income. If Unless they're buying organic vegetables, I say, you know, just focus your money on beef, right? So it, for instance, the cow has more stomach, so there's some suggestion that they can even, uh, you know, process out glyphosate and some of these toxins a bit better than us. Uh, we look here at the uh, diet of the Eskimo. This is a fantastic paper that I wish uh, was more well known. So this is a paper where he had some Arctic explorers uh, back in the 1950s that went and looked at the Eskimos to see what these people were eating. And this was these were contemporaries, contemporaries of Ansel Keys. So some of you may know Ansel Keys. He's the guy who gave us the whole 70 years of low fat diets, right? Because he had the hypothesis that uh, the, the Sardinians and, and some Italians and Greeks, because they ate uh, more olives and, and less meats, that there was less saturated fat uh, in their diet and thus less heart disease. And we look at the other side of the world and we looked at this guy and he was looking at Eskimos and they had essentially no cardiac diseases. Now, these people... They eat a high saturated fat diet and a high meat diet. Mostly they can sit, they subsist off of red meats. They would hunt uh, the seals. They would hunt um, elk if they can get it. Um, and yes, they did start dying out, but this was from Western influence, right? We know the story of how the Native Americans were uh, mostly eradicated, and it was through eradication of the bison. You destroy the bison, you destroy the Native American population's source of meat, you destroy their, their energy, their, their willpower, and their, their source of income and food. So if you take the, the Native person away from the ancestral diet, which is mostly a red meat-based diet, they get weaker, okay? Um, they lived off of what, a bison, antelope, a caribou, moose, beaver, bear, hares, anything they could get their hands on, a lot of seals as well. But when they were introduced to the white man's diet, flour, uh, sugar, tea, lard, so these three ingredients, they, they liked it a lot. When you give them sugar, they ate a lot of it. What they start getting, they started getting Western diseases. They started getting uh, um, diseases of the eyes that we would see perhaps in diabetics. We had this ophthalmologist look at their eyes back then. And, you know, what did he suggest? Did he suggest, uh, you know, surgery, Lasix? Did he suggest a... Uh, uh, metformin. No, what this ophthalmologist in 1946 suggested was for these natives to go back on their ancestral diet and eat organ meats, right? So we have this understanding, at least with uh, ancestral populations. So even if you look at current ancestral populations in Alaska, there's actually a lot of uh, positive reinforcement for them to actually eat seal, right? Yes, they are encouraged to eat seal because this is their ancestral food. It's known to make them healthier, right? We look here at the, the TB, the tuberculosis. We think of this as an infectious disease, right? But the, the Eskimos only started getting tuberculosis when they were introduced to the white man's diet, right? If we look at some theories as to what tuberculosis is and was, it was potentially our evolutionary friend that would produce NAD in times of meat starvation. This is a fantastic article by the International Journal of Tryptophan Research, written in 2017. It's very lengthy. It'll take you about an hour to read it. But it goes through kind of the evolutionary aspect of human civilization as it relates to NAD. And in times of great meat starvations, you would see sometimes reactivation of tuberculosis. And in times of plenty, you would see reductions in tuberculosis. 
it's very fascinating, this tuberculosis thing, because these populations, they live with it inside their lungs, and it only reactivates uh, when they are fed uh, a Western diet. CoQ10, um, eat your beef heart raw, right? So this is, again, comes back to the Maillard reaction. When you superheat foods and when you heat foods, you'll lose the nutrient quality. So we all know the importance of CoQ10. All your patients on statin drugs, if you're using statins, should be on CoQ10. But you can get all the CoQ10 you need from a couple cubes of raw beef heart. You can, you can chop it up, dip it in some smack sally sauce. You can swallow it whole. It's a very cheap and affordable method for getting CoQ10 in your bodies. If you look again at the prices on CoQ10 on full scripts, it's like $70 for like 30 capsules. It's impossible for a lot of patients. Just eat beef heart. Uh, so this is interesting. Uh, fermented foods, we have to talk about this because all ancestral cultures have a fermented food culture, right? The Cree word uh, for Eskimos is uskipu, which means he who eats the meat raw. Uh, there's actually a very weird uh, dish where they would stuff um, stuff dead seal and, and leave it to ferment under a rock for about three months. This was called a kiviak. Um, another uh, recipe is caribou liver allowed to ferment inside a moss-filled caribou stomach under a hot sun for some days before eating. This is considered a delicacy. We, uh, there's a lecture, I think maybe someone gave it here. It's called the, the Disappearing Microbiome. And this is from our overuse of antibiotics, our sterile civilization, but potentially also our lack of fermented foods. So again, fermenting foods has always been part of the ancestral diet. So I like to do raw kefir. I find it actually very tasty. Uh, raw kefir has actually some anti-COVID effects, um, immune modulatory effects, it's antioxidant. So very cheap and easy to do. You just get some kefir crystals, you can ferment some raw milk. And sure enough, within a couple of days, you have kefir. You can sweeten this if you'd like. I typically will mix four raw eggs in kefir, stir it up, and I will drink this sometime if I'm in a rush in the morning trying to see patients. Uh, collagen peptides, I recommend these. These are from the cartilage, either between the joint knuckles of the cow, or you can get marine collagen, which is the fish scales or the rib cage cartilage. And collagen peptides have, again, a lot of anti-inflammatory benefits. They help with arthritis, uh, osteoarthritis, so treating arthritis, burn wound, topical applications. So a lot of regenerative aspects to getting collagen back into the body. But again, lack of collagen is associated with a lot of age-related decline. Uh, so uh, supplementing this may have a lot of benefits, uh, both preventatively and for uh, treatment of diseases. Uh, so in conclusion, as the British Medical Journal summarized so perfectly, it's time to shift the public health message in the prevention and treatment of coronary heart disease away from measuring certain lipids and reducing, and reducing dietary saturated fat. Coronary heart disease is a chronic inflammatory disease and it can be re effectively reduced. reduced. Uh, and my approach to this is yes, exercise of course, but lowering the inflammation in the diet, just removing the processed foods, incorporating back in some of these ancestral foods so you can get the nutrients into the diet. And sure enough is what you'll see is your patients will have more vitality, more energy. They'll be calling you less for illness. Uh, their muscle mass will be improving. They'll be losing weight. They'll be able to reduce their budget on, uh, on, salary, on, on, on supplements, save money there, and really save money overall on foods because the ancestral diet is very affordable. You're not eating out so much. You're satiated more, so your overall calorie intake is lower. And so there's a lot of benefits. It was financially for your patients, uh, for your own uh, you know, benefit of not having to deal with so many sick patients. Um, but also you're, you're improving civilization as a whole and society as a whole by reducing the healthcare burden associated with uh, the, the SAD diet, the standard American diet. Uh, if, you need, if you want some more um, sources of where to find some of these things, you can follow my fiance's uh, Instagram cooking show where she comes up with ancestral recipes. You can find my YouTube series, which is uh, more for uh, comedic relief, if anything, because I'm not the best chef. Uh, but primal kitchen condiments, con good condiments can be found without soybean oil. Uh, simple milk products. You can get uh, crackers and so forth made with avocado oil instead, like from Siete or Simple Mills. 
Uh, U.S. Wellness Meats, you can literally order organ meats shipped right to your door. You can get thymus gland, like really esoteric things to with, and, and get this to your patients. Desiccated organ supplements, of course, you can do that. Uh, they're a bit more expensive. I always just recommend the real thing. And then raw milk, Google realmilk.com, and you can find your local farmer. You know, Ask your local farmer if, if he has some for you. Uh, here is some of my contact information. Uh, I have a YouTube channel, Facebook, Rumble, TikTok. I'm always posting more educational content like this, trying to educate people about um, how to improve their patients' lives. Thank you. Stefan, that was, uh, yeah. that was that was great, excellent. Yeah, I learned uh, a few, uh, quite a few things here. Uh, but uh, I did have a couple questions. If... Yes. So, is does is, is this similar to the carnivore diet? And so, carnivore diet is restriction of all carbohydrates. Now, uh, <clears throat> I don't do that uh, for the most part. I, I only did that for my photo shoot. You saw my picture there; I was pretty lean. Uh, yeah. It will deplete you of water. So I lost about seven pounds the week I did uh, carnivore and it was all from electrolyte depletion. For me, it's not the best for performance wise. I just don't perform at that high explosive I need for professional tennis events. Um, I, I, carnivore is fun to try out, sure. Okay. And then um, is this diet, obviously you're, you're uh, in, I mean, you're healthy in shape. I mean, you know, more than anybody else I, I know right now. And um, so is this your approach in the diet that you're doing? Does this work better when you're, you are working out more regularly, uh, more maxing out? Because um, yeah. I'm sitting there thinking if somebody is more sedentary, you know, would, would they respond to the, the high protein, the high meat diet the same yeah. way? Well, if we, if we look at some of the the literature on where these uh, lower carbohydrate diets are used, they're used in pretty diseased populations for reversing the metabolic syndrome, uh, the pro-heart trial. So improving patients' outcomes in heart failure and diabetes are pretty sick populations here, probably not doing the high protein that I'm doing. So this is showing a 30% protein intake. I'm doing more 70%. But uh, you can use this in pretty sedentary and diseased populations and see a benefit. Okay. No, yeah, no, very good. I, I like the idea of the uh, the organs. Uh, you know, for, it just never crossed my mind, like uh, beef liver. And, um, and like you said, some of the places that you had listed at, at the end of the lecture, where you can order them if, if uh, you know, they don't have the, yeah. the selection at the local. I, I, I don't know if Whole Foods no has some of these things no okay no, 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 no. but you can get so if you go to your little uh, local hispanic store around the corner i guarantee you they have chicken feet they have chicken uh, hearts they have chicken livers you can find these things probably not the uh, grass-fed source but they're everywhere you just need to know where to look so are there any organs do you we should avoid i mean so it sounds like heart uh, liver no, no organs you should avoid. I would just go towards a uh, higher quality ones. So if you're going to get chickens, uh, I would, I would make sure you're, you get it from a good source. A lot of chickens are fed junk and they're monogastric. So they only have one stomach. So they don't filter out all the toxins as well as cows do, which I think have three stomachs. So they can filter out a lot of things. Uh, but even cows will get diseased livers as I pointed out. So again, try to get the grass fed as much as you can. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, anybody who wants the slides, there's a link here in the chat. You can uh, copy that. And <clears throat> Joe, if you can get it, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get it. We'll put it on the website also. Um, uh, omega quant, Steve, you talked about um, omega-3s and omega-6. Uh, fatty acids and measuring them. Uh, uh, there's an omega quant testing that can be done for $60. That's good. Okay. Um, and uh, I'm not sure what this means exactly. Low carb Boca this year had a great presentation on why calories in calories out do not work and calories out don't work. Okay. 
So low carb Volta was uh, an event. I'm taking it. Uh-huh. Dr. Eads of Protein Power Fame gave the talk, and I believe it's on YouTube. So if anybody wants to look at that, I went ahead and checked it out, Doc. It's called Dr. Michael Eads Weight Loss Calories mm-hmm. Insulin or a Third Alternative. It's under the Low Carb Down Under YouTube channel. Yeah, it's a good channel. I've watched it extensively. Okay. Um, does lamb count as red meat? Yes. Okay. Do grass-fed farmers feed their cows grass that has not been contaminated with glyphosate? Yeah, again, that's hard to tell. But, you know, again, they are trigastric animals, so they can filter out this stuff uh, potentially a bit better than, say, chickens can or we can. So. Uh, but ideally not. We get a good farmer who doesn't do that. Mm-hmm. Um, there's got, we got some initials here, uh, some, some letters. So I'm not, you know, I'm old, so I don't really know what they exactly mean. What do you do with patients that have EPI and also for people with TMAO issues? So, uh, I personally, I don't know what either of those are. <laughs> uh, Dr. Uh, Beverly, if you're out there, um, can you unmute yourself and, uh, let us know what these mean or Steve, you know what they are? I think she's talking about uh, a genetic. Adam, um, you, oh, there we go. Hi. Um, Hi. So EPI is exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. And a lot of our patients have like fecal elastase levels of even less than 200. So they have insufficient pancreatic enzymes. And I give them enzymes, but I'm not sure that that's always adequate in, in our older patients to really digest red meat very well. I mean, I do have them cook it to death. You know, I just have them cook it and slow cook it. So it's like super soft as possible, but um, they still often have a hard time digesting it. You you may want to try the opposite, actually. So if you look at some of the literature of what happens when you superheat and super cook things, it actually, it removes enzymes that actually help and aid in digestion. So the opposite may be more beneficial for your patients in cooking it more lightly and maybe even doing raw, raw oysters, for example, uh, maybe even some raw organ meats may be better to digest for them. I think it would be a tough sell for some of my patients, but I, I don't disagree. I, I grew up, my mother made sweetbreads, which is like the thymus gland of the cow. I don't know if any of you guys ever read that. Uh, I, it's and right tongue down. and uh, liver. And I remember growing up with all that. The other thing is the TMAO is a compound that's made with people who have maldigestion. Uh, that is an inflammatory compound. And, and so some of my patients have that issue where if they eat red meat, they create too much TMAO and they get um, inflammation and pain from it. <clears throat> so th- those, are the, those are my stumbling blocks uh, with my patient population. Yeah, and gallbladder removals too may pose a challenge. Yes, yes. Yeah, I have them all on enzymatic uh, or digestive enzymes as well. Okay, okay. Uh, What would you say your ratio of organ meats to regular meat is? Well, if you make a beef liver pate, you you cook up a a whole pound of that. That'll last you a while. I'd probably eat uh, usually about six ounces every day. If you look at some of these ancestral supplements, they'll recommend six capsules a day. That pretty much equates to about six ounces. You can get it in a couple times a week. You don't need to do much, specifically if you, you're you eating like beef liver or for the vitamin A concentration, you don't need too much. Like three times a week would be fine. Uh, if you're trying to fix like iron deficiency anemia, bison spleen has a high iron concentration, so you can rapidly fix that in your anemic patients. You know, forget about IV infusions of iron or making them take those iron capsules that make everyone sick. Uh, just have them eat bison spleen. And that'll resolve relatively quickly. I'm not sure I would get bison spleen in Reno. <laughs> you can order it from North Star Bison online. They'll ship it right to your door. Okay. All right. Good to know. Um, like like uh, our previous uh, questioner, that, that could be a little bit of a tough sell. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, use the Smack Sally Tijuana flat sauce. You chop up this bison spleen super fine. You take a fork, you dip it in the sa- Sally sauce, and down the hatch, all you taste is really the Tijuana flat sauce. Mm-hmm. Okay. 
Um, uh, Dr. Cruz says he had a patient 55 years old develop proteinuria. How much protein is too much for the kidney? Did he have CKD? Again, if you, they have the CKD, they, they, they need to be careful with it. But if they don't have CKD, it's okay. Okay. Do you have have any? Like, suppose they do have a uh, you know chronic kidney disease. Well, I would still try to optimize uh, protein intake, uh, monitor kidney function, obviously, but and you know, hydrate very well. But uh, you know, I don't think it's it's probably the other medications that they're on that are causing the kidney uh, damage. You had to deep fry something a few times a year besides beef tallow. Can you use lard or anything else to avoid seed oils? Yeah, I use lard, tallow, avocado oil. Uh, even olive oil, I've been learning, has a higher heat tolerance than I initially thought. Um, olive oil is an unsaturated fat or a monounsaturated fat, and it's supposed to have a heat tolerance of only 350 degrees Fahrenheit. But there are some antioxidants in there that seem to protect it against heating. So it may be okay to fry as well. Okay. Um, there's a statement, old people benefit from betaine hydrochloride tablets to help digest meat and young. Yes. You use them at all? Only for people who have been on those omeprazoles, you know, that stuff's over the counter now. Everyone has messed up stomach acidity. They have the stomach acidity of a deer. I didn't have that slide here, but you can give someone the stomach acidity of a deer of 7.7 pH by feeding them omeprazole. The human stomach has a stomach acidity akin to that of the red falcon or the bald eagle. So we're about 1.3 to 1.5 pH but you can mess that up pretty easily with omeprazole and so forth, which everyone is eating like candy. So yeah, they probably need to do some HCL. You need to fix their stomach acidity. Okay. Can you repeat that? I, 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 I want you all out there to, to see the things you learned on, on our webinar. We have the, the, the pH, the stomach pH of a falcon yes, versus, the, the, versus a, a deer. Yeah. I can try to find the slides here, but uh Yep, uh, bald eagle. <laughs> oh, here it is. I got the slide here. You guys will like this one. Uh, let me share my screen here. Here's my lecture on how to fix acid reflux naturally. Okay, okay, here we go. So we have here a whole uh, spreadsheet here. So let's find uh, the deer. Okay, 5.5 is stomach acidity. Elephant actually has decent stomach acidity. Where's the human? Human here, 1.5. Okay, bald eagle, 1.3. Okay, so we're closer to the bald eagle than we are with the deer, right? But, you know, human here on omeprazole, that's a low number. I've seen in the literature as high as seven, high as eight pH. You, so you can mess up a human stomach pretty easily with the stuff that the FDA now has over the counter. You can get it at Costco in bulk if you want to eat a lot of it. It's nuts. Mm -hmm. I go back one. Go back to the your your spreadsheet again, sir. Yeah, here. I think, Great I think, Falcon one point eight. I think I think the uh, I think I see a ferret. A ferret? What's the ferret at? One point five down at 1. the bottom. 5. Oh yeah, yeah, that's pretty good. The wandering albatross is 1.5. It's an obligate scavenger. So you can see uh, these. We're we're uh, the ferret is a carnivore, a generalist carnivore. So we have the stomach acidity of the carnivore here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you can have all sorts of uh, metaphors for the wandering albatross, which has the same P stomach pH as us, right? I'll just leave it to your uh, man. You don't have to I've answer never, that. I'll just I've leave it to your man. Well, what's, <laughs> to your what's, your, what's your expertise with wandering albatross? Uh, it, 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 not, not in the literal sense. It's, it's figuratively. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, can you put in uh, your, your fiance's cooking site? Yes. Yeah, she'll be happy to get more followers. Let's see here it is. Here it is. Copy that. Do you have any experience or follow the um, 
Western A Price Foundation? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and what is that for those of us who don't know what that is? Weston A. Price is a dentist that traveled the world in the early 1900s to find and identify the ancestral civilization still existing at that time and what they ate. And what he identified is that had, they had very good bone structure. So he's a dentist who always looked at the teeth. And he found that these uh, populations had fantastic teeth, better than Western civilization. And But then he found the same tribes maybe a mile down the road that were introduced to the Western, the white man's diet, and they had all sorts of crooked teeth and cavities. So he came to the conclusion that dentistry is really an obsolete uh, practice if you can feed someone an ancestral diet, which is quite astounding. And a follow-up to that with uh, Dr. William Kelly. He's the one that studied Dr. Price's process and came up with the metabolic code. And he's, he's the one that supposedly started to fix his patients by figuring out whether they were <clears throat> metabolically equipped to eat vegetables and fruits or meats or both. Have you gone into that study? No, I'm not sure of him. Okay. I if I can find this link. Yeah. So let, let me just let me just sort of play devil's advocate for just a minute. So um, what you what you just said was that you know Western diet, Western civilization screws everything up. Essentially, um, yeah, yeah, they messed it up a lot. Okay, but you know the ancestral dieteers, the you know the, the the originals back there. You know when you got to be thirty, if you lived to be thirty years old, you were old. <laughs> Yeah, so that statistic comes from the average death rate. So they have a lot of infant mortality, unfortunately, in these populations. So their OBGYN care isn't up to standard. So if you look at that, it'll bring down the average uh, life expectancy to about 30. But if they can get it past childhood, they typically do okay and can live up into their 70s. Uh, so what we're using is the ancestral diet here which can give someone vitality and prevent a lot of modern diseases. But then we're also using the anti-aging medicine. We're, so we're using hormone optimization. We're using modern medicine. So hopefully we can get people to 100 and they don't have just that terrible disease that we see with everyone uh, you know, at Walmart, right? We're trying to implement both the ancestral with the modern for the best possible outcome. Okay. I'm going to skip the one question for a moment, but the bottom was who's going to win the Super Bowl, Eagles or Chiefs, as you can see behind me, those of you who know where I'm from. And to let you all know that I, I put, put, I put a, a bet on the Philadelphia Eagles to win the Super Bowl on September 1st before the season started at 25 to 1. So, okay. I'll so, make sure to watch. Okay. Um, now back to our regular show. Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, so Dr. Smith asked about um, religious restrictions on raw meats, and you know, and and you know, and other things. You know, there's there's uh, um, there, there's a lot of religious restrictions on on different types of foods. Um, how do how do you um, sort of uh, you know maneuver around that? Cook it lightly. Don't nuke the food. You de you degrade it the harder you cook it. Mm -hmm. Slow cook it overnight, low temperature. If you're doing a stew. Uh, if you're going to grill a steak, you know, rare, ideally. Um, same with organ meats. Try not to cook it too hard. And obviously with milk, the same concept. The harder you cook it, the less nutrients you'll get out of it. Okay. All right. Um, but again, um, there are a lot of, uh, you know, re restrictions on raw meats and in certain, certain different types of foods, you know, pork products, you know, in particular, um, and uh, mixing different types of, of, of foods, you know, kosher, halal, you know, have, have restrictions. Um, you've come across the, those and, and maneuvered around those in your, in your, in your travels? No, I don't have a lot of Jewish patients or Muslim patients, so that's not the population I really work with. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, anybody else out there have any? Uh... Okay. Um... Uh, here's that drkelly.net is the is the website for the doctor late Dr. William Kelly that you, yeah. you mentioned. I'll check it out. Okay. I did have a question. 
Um, I test a lot of my patients for antiparietal cell antibodies and intrinsic factor antibodies. And it's amazing to me how many people have an autoimmune gastritis. Um, even I even have teenagers with it. And that makes it difficult if that's been in place for much time because then they lose their capacity to, to make their own stomach acid. So in that case, would you just give the betaine hydrochloride and enzymes or what would you do with that? I have a whole gut protocol for people with uh, problems with the gut. And so it includes, as Dr. Guilford is aware of, uh, the BPC-157, the gut healing peptide. You'll find a lot of improvements in gut in the gut problems with that. And I use the biocidin protocol. So a lot of these people, they have overgrowth of yeast and bacteria in their gut. So we just do a nice little cleanse one month. And typically we see a good improvement with this. You add on a bit of colostrum, a bit of collagen, and their, their gut feels a lot better. Okay. Um, could you elaborate a little bit on the biocidin protocol? Or yeah, I can. Uh, I'm actually doing research with biocidin on this because I've been using this so extensively. This uh, this protocol. So yeah, it's uh, it's BPC one five seven, lozenge or oral capsule once daily, usually for about a month, and then the biocidin cleanse, which is their liquid botanical solution, their binder and their spore-based probiotic. And then we add on colostrum, any of your favorite brand of colostrum. Uh, and then we add on a bit of collagen. And uh, obviously we cut out the insults, we cut out gluten, we cut out the soybean oil, canola oil, all this garbage. We get them off the birth control if they're a woman on birth control. We get them off of the PPIs, if they're taking those things, the antiacids, we get them off ibuprofens and aspirins if they're taking that stuff. We get them off the six cups of coffee a day that they're drinking, right? We try to manage their stress, try to optimize their hormones so, you know, they're not pushing their adrenals to the limit and uh, fight or flight mode constantly. We try, you know, try to treat the psychiatric aspect of this. A lot of people are in a lot of stress and they give themselves stress ulcers. Um, so um, very multifactorial to try to improve this, but um, yeah, the mainstay is, is BPC and then the biocide and at least a bare minimum. Where do you like to get your BPC from? Amex Pharmacy. They do lozenges. Okay. But I get it from all over the place. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's very, very common at this point. What's your experience with uh, that glyceride licorice? That's how I got off of omeprazole. Licorice, huh? No, I never used that. That, that glyceride licorice. <laughs> Mm, special kind? I'm not familiar. Um, you can get deglycerinated, some. deglycerinated liquid. Oh, okay. From that yeah, This is uh, Designs for Health, DGL yeah. Synergy. Yeah. And it's uh, calcium from calcium glycerophosphate, and then diglyceride licorice and glycine. <clears throat> why, why do you think that helped? What's the mechanism? I think it just stabilized um, the acid. It seems to work. Uh, Beverly, you want to know about more BPC? I have a lecture on my YouTube channel about BPC 157. Yeah, yeah I'm not sure the answer to the uh, the uh, glycerinated licorice. We've used zinc carnosine also for um, acid reflux and GERD and, and hiatal hernia. So. So, and uh, the comment is that deglycerinated licorice coats the lining, so. Oh, nice. Yeah, my YouTube channel is Iron Drake Primary Care. I have a lot of resources there. I'm going through all the peptides. My goal is to publish my, um, my use of each peptide out there because we're having some amazing results with these things. Yeah, I agree. There's another, there's another peptide. Uh, called KPV. And I, I know it's good for gut inflammation. I, I don't know if it's specifically uh, anti-inflammatory for the, uh, for the stomach, uh, but it, it might be. And it, and it may be because it, uh, its effects on the cannabinoid receptors uh, 
Um, and it's, I guess it's an analog of melanocortin, which is something that we already produce. I believe our pineal gland produces it. Uh, but um, yeah, I'm seeing people uh, using both BPC and KPV in combination if, if BPC-157 isn't enough for, for uh, uh, gut issues. And I am seeing a lot of um, dealing uh, patients with a lot of bloating. I, I am seeing a lot of yeast overgrowth or candida overgrowth, or at least it's responding very powerfully to antifungals. At least the extreme cases I'm treating with itraconazole. I do like the idea of the, the biocidin. Um, you know, gut protocols, I, I'm weak in general as far as the, the different, uh, the different uh, uh, programs. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's my experience with that, you know, KPV being another peptide that can be used in concert with the BPC-157. That's cool. Have you ever heard of lorazotide? Lorazotide sounds really familiar for some this reason. One, this one's wild. It's literally an oral peptide derived from Vibrio cholera, but it apparently seems to be able to uh, if, fix broken gap junctions in patients with uh, the gluten issues. Yeah, you know, I like your approach to peptides. I mean, there's a peptide for everything out there, essentially. And most of them we don't really see so much off the shelf, but the more, the more I research, the, the more um, looking at labs that we don't necessarily, you know, more research oriented labs and, and they have catalogs of, of peptides for, it seems essentially everything. And, and you know, the, the cool thing is in learning the peptides, you really learn the physiology, yeah. uh, you know, that because it, they relate to all aspects of, of, um, cellular pathways yeah and, and where do you get peptides well they're found in organ meats take bpc 157 for example found in tripe cow stomach cow intestine right take the thymosin alpha 1 and the thymosin beta 4 found in thymus gland right i just learned mm -hmm. about another one the other day that's found in spleen and so obviously we can assume what the spleen does is a peptide has immune potential healing benefits and hasn't been synthesized yet, but they found it in spleen. So my theory is you can eat the organ and it'll heal you, at least if you don't cook it too hot, because these peptides are very delicate. If you ever order peptides online, it's, it's, it's shipped frozen to you from the pharmacy or cold. They're very delicate 3D structures that are destroyed by stomach acidity and not BBC 157, it's, it's uh, gastric stable. But these peptides, again, as my point is not overheating milk and meats and so forth is that you denature uh, the peptides. Yeah, I love that idea. Uh, literally, it makes sense that you're trying to uh, boost your immunity, you know, eat thymus. And, it, you know, intuitively, it, it makes sense. But I, I, again, it seems like one of those things that is obvious that, you know, because again, our Western uh, programming and diet and, you know, just habits just make you know, at least I, I feel like I've been oblivious. It, it wouldn't have even have crossed my mind. But, um, you know, there's a group in Europe uh, called uh, the European Wellness Group. Uh, most of their research done out of Germany and they have uh, other sort of satellite clinics um, uh, with uh, some Russian scientists and Asian scientists um, that I'm familiar with. And, um, you know, their products are all derived from you know, all the different organs of the, of the lamb. And these are mitochondrial peptides that have been purified, but they're specific uh, for each gland. And, and so if you, if you want to, you know, address the male vitality more naturally, encouraging your body to produce more testosterone for, um, you know, for, I guess for any age at this point for males, uh, adult males, but those, um, those mitochondrial peptides re reduce oxidative stress. Those are intracellular peptides that reduce oxidative stress uh, within the mitochondria of the specified organ. And they have compounds that have like 12 different organs involved with, with the uh, production of testosterone, you know, including pituitary and hypothalamus and, and uh, liver and spleen and, and testicular. And 
it works. I actually, um, uh, just personal use, um, you know, it, it definitely helped. I had, I had uh, some testicular atrophy uh, from my early use of testosterone, not really thinking about what I was doing. And uh, it actually it actually had a profound effect on it. Uh, but the concept just makes a lot of sense that, you know, if we want to, you know, like you said, you're getting you know, like the vitamin A from, from the, from the beef liver. If you're, if you need something more of that, well, then you eat more of that organ. I, I think that's brilliant. Yeah. And it's affordable. And it's affordable. <laughs> yeah. A lot cheaper than, uh, you know, mitochondrial peptides. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the same concept. I, I really like that. Yeah. You do house calls for your patients? Yes. Yeah. Not all of them, but, uh, you know, my, my special patients. Yeah. Yeah. You go through their fridge. You'd be shocked what you find. <laughs> Bologna and, uh, I pulled out hot loaves, dogs. <laughs> loaves of moldy bread at this last place. The, the shelf full of soybean oil condiments in her shelf. She actually had a whole gallon of soybean oil that she was cooking with. And I said, listen, you're trying to fix yourself. You got to throw this out. She said, oh, no, I'm going to feed it to my chickens. I'm like, no, you're eating the eggs from the chickens. Don't feed it to your chickens. You're going to make them sick, right? Whatever you feed them is going to be their eggs. You're going to eat their eggs. Their eggs are going to be soybean oil eggs, right? They're going to be high omega-6 eggs. You don't want this. How did you get into diet to this level? I mean, it seems like you have a unique perspective on, on diet and you understand, you know, diet all the way down to the the farm level and it seems like is this just well, something you had a special interest in or no my, my dad's here he's in the chat here too and thomas i don't know if you can hear us but uh thomas raised me this way we never went to a doctor he didn't bring me you know to a doctor for well visits right it was all nutrition in our household and we didn't always have the ancestral diet in our household uh we we actually were macrobiotic i don't know if you know what that is but that's a pretty uh no, I, I don't. More fringe diet than what I was talking about. But we were that for a while. And it, we were all dietary modalities growing up to uh, improve health. Interesting. Did, did you grow up in a more rural setting? or No, I grew up in Europe, in Italy, in Germany, um, and then eventually Florida. But uh, I really started studying this hard when um, I, I had to quit my tennis career because of my lateral epicondylitis. It was so severe. I hung up the racket. I thought that was it. Uh, but it was in PA school, actually. I didn't learn this in class, obviously. I was actually playing tennis on tennis courts. And this naturopathic physician, he hit me up. And he's like, hey, I want to train with you. I'm like, okay, yeah, I can play maybe one or two days a week. And he's like, why can't you play more? And I was like, my arm feels like it's going to fall off. And he was like, cut out the gluten, the alcohol, the dairy, and the nightshades. I'm like, what's a nightshade? And <laughs> sure enough, I cut out this stuff and my tennis elbow went away. And I was like, oh my God, this is nuts. Food has an effect on arthritis. What? That's not the way that they're teaching me in evidence-based medicine here in PA school. The evidence base is NSAIDs, rest, and a corticosteroid injection. What is this naturopathic quackery? But it worked. And then, so, and I was like, how do you know all this? I asked him, how do you know all this? And he said, PubMed. And I was like, you can find this all on the internet? And so then I just started researching this stuff. Yeah, that's a great thing. Um, just going to PubMed, uh, same thing for myself. It's just anything, you know, I, you know what it is, is I have more questions that pop up in my head. You know, the more I keep doing what I'm doing now, you know, I'm questioning everything I ever learned, you know, and I'm also questioning, do I actually know something? Do I actually know this or, or, or am I, do I think I know it or I've been pretending to know it? And if I can't even answer for myself, it's like, boom, let's go to PubMed. And sure enough, there's going to be, uh, you know, three, four good articles that I'll print out and I'll just skim through them and just try to, you know, and just see if I can't grab some, uh, uh, some, solid knowledge you know or try to you know see what the commonality or just wait have something jump out but i i tell you there, there's something about it's actually there it's it's a scientific article it's not because they said it it's not because 
um, you think this is what it is, or, you know, like you said, you know, I learned it, or they said something about it in PA school, and, and there it is. And, and if, if anybody wants to, you know, question me, it's, it's like, well, this is a scientific, this is scientific data. And, um, and, that, and that's right. And it's, it also goes in lines with, you know, my own experiences, so I, I can relate it. And, and, you know, there's a more, I have more confidence with, you know, what seems to present itself with the truth, um, combining my experiences with uh, some, you know, commonalities amongst the articles, but, uh, you know, and then it's just more solid. And then, of course, if presenting it, it's just a whole nother level, because if you can't talk about it in front of people, you don't really know it. But if you can talk about it and explain it, it's in you. Right. And I teach this to my patients every day. And when I do these house calls, when I speak to them on telemedicine, this is critical towards what I do. It's just teaching them about diet because this is where, you know, we can talk about methylene blue and oxytocin and, and all these things, but it comes down to what they're putting in their mouths every day. Yeah, well, you know, I think it's fantastic. And, and you have, you know, this knowledge, fortunately, you grew up with it uh, to a degree and, and did your own research obviously. But, um, you know, for most of us, I can always speak for myself. I mean, I, I can't complain about, you know, how I was raised, but I can say I was completely, well, harsh. I, I was ignorant, you know, I mean, I, I mean, my, my mother did a lot of um, personal farming. So, you know, shared lots and things. And, and so I did have exposure to natural foods, canned foods. Um, and, and th that knowledge, but, you know, the, the mainstream was just, you know, I'd look at all my friends and they're eating their fruit loops and, uh, you know, all their you know, fruit juice things and that are just really just syrup water. And it's just amazing. And, and the problem is it's like, all of a sudden it's like, I see this material, it makes sense, but it actually would, I would actually have to take time to learn this stuff. I, I mean, I would actually have to focus on it and say, this is what I'm going to do. and I'm going to figure this out um, to, in order to get to this place where I, I would feel confident ordering foods from the meats and, and cooking them at the right temperature and adding the, the oils to it that makes it more tolerable. I'm sure some of it actually tastes fine. Um, we just don't know it. Um, but I, I even thought about hiring somebody just to you know, somebody that could actually, uh, you know, mentor me, teach me, um, you know, give that one-on-one -on -one and so to speed up the learning process. Uh, but, you know, there's so many other things happening and, and, you know, distracted by this or taking care of that patient, but it really would, I think that's what causes people to have, like you said, their refrigerators, you know, look terrible. I mean, my refrigerator looks like it's mostly peptides. It's actually quite entertaining <laughs> but um you know maybe some moldy bread at the same time um but i mean that's really what it is it, you know you've reminded us myself i can only speak for myself is is you know we can't forget this part and and it's, and it's not like something that's just common sense oh we just learn it in two seconds it, it's the same thing we have to put in the same discipline and you know, at least commit to, you know, if you can't focus on it hundred percent, focus on, you know, you know, maybe just say, you know, I'm going to make sure maybe one day a week, I'm going to make one of these meals. And that's how I kind of, you know, Sunday is going to be my ancestral, uh, I'm going to cook a, an organ or something, you know, and make it that, it, try to make it simple in, in, in order to get the habit. And, and then it just becomes, oh, that's not so difficult. Um, but I, I find change in, in diet difficult to, to get to a, to turn it into nutritional supplementation. Yeah, it's a lifestyle, um, but you'll find it's uh, pretty easy, you know, to uh, one, maintain your body mass, your physique. You'll find that you can maintain muscle and stay lean very easily. So uh, it's very convenient as well because you can you can make a stew and you can have the food for a couple of days, um, so you have plenty of food. So 
it really saves on time because you're not always hungry, not always eating so much. And it saves your patients time and obesity as well. So it's, there's a very practical reason to do this. Okay. And you said your wife actually has a, a cookbook specific? Yeah, she has an this? Instagram page. It's, uh, we put okay. that. Well, maybe that would make it easier, you know, then I don't have to guess. So how do I get to? Uh, I put it up Instagram? here. And then I also have a YouTube channel and I have a playlist called Cooking with Sturf. Sturf is my nickname. So it's comedic value there, but I have some very, very simple recipes to follow there. My, my fiance, she's very uh, artistic with her. She makes a beef liver pate. She'll make an ice cream out of egg yolks and raw milk. It's uh, she's incredible stuff. Here's there. the, here's the uh, website for the, uh, your page. Whatever. <clears throat> we didn't get a name, just a fiance. So yeah, her her, her her name's Logan, and she may do uh, a lecture for you all if you want it on the ketogenic diet. She's been uh, experimenting with that a lot, uh, having some very right. interesting. Uh, you'll get you'll get her. I'll, I'll get in touch with her. Right. Um, there was a question about glutamine for um, leaky gut. Oh yeah, well, glutamine. Yeah, you can get that from uh, from colostrum and collagen, but you can also add it to the protocol. Sure, that's a good one. Okay. And um, how long does one stay on BPC one fifty seven? Um, it's just a month protocol for at least our gut protocol. Sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, for other protocols like uh, you know, if I injure myself. I'll do a, I'll usually do an injection. Um, a couple of days is enough for me to get myself out of a, a neck pain injury. Yeah, we do. Um, we, we've used the, the injectables for, um, we've saved many, many a patient uh, surgeries. Um, it's really quite remarkable. Uh, shoulders, uh, we do really well. Um, knees, at least 50, 60, 60% 60 uh, we can cancel surgeries. Even even low backs. Uh, I have one kid who was a um, football player at University of Nebraska, and he, he tore a hamstring, and it, it didn't heal. He didn't play for two years, and he came in to see me uh, right before <clears throat> right before he was supposed to go back to school in August. We gave him three injections, two milligrams each, right into the hamstring, and 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 it healed <laughs> in, after two years. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, I, I, I did the he's, same for myself. He's playing, like, you know, he's playing. It's, it's, it's really quite remarkable stuff. Um, and um, so that's all the questions in the chat. Anybody else have anything to add questions? Thank you, Steve, as, as always. And thank you. For, thank you, Father, for being here. Um, and uh, we had a, a, a lot of new names. Um, if I don't have your email address, you want to be on our email list, please let me know. Um, you can get me here at drbill9 at gmail. Um, the link that you used to get on today is the link that you always use. So if you save that, that that'll, that'll get you on. Next week, we have Dr. Benoit Tano. And unfortunately, my uh, calendar got wiped out, and I haven't gotten in touch with him, so I don't know what the topic is. <laughs> but he's 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 quite a, a prolific writer, a medical writer. Um, so we will have him next week, and then uh, February twenty first. Um, you know, uh, batten down the hatches. You know, uh, uh, hide 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 your loved ones. Uh, Doctor Peter McCullough will be here, and uh, we'll see who else tries to shut us down. So. Um, uh, after that. So, um, so thank you, Steve, again. Um, and uh, we're going to uh, go through the, we're going to ask you to come back for the, uh, uh, what did you have, the leaky gut protocol you, you showed us? Well, or? I want to give you guys the second part of this, which is um, resistance training. And, you know, what this looks like, the literature on resistance training to reverse disease and how to incorporate it. So that's the that's the two pronged approach I have: ancestral diet, resistance training. All right, March seventh, one month from today, you're on. All right, sounds good. Okay. Resistance training. Okay, you got it. All right, you heard it here. So if you like this one, he'll be back again exactly one month from today. All right, sounds um, good. Okay, um, we got um, uh, Muhammad Healthcare Consultant RCM. Thank you for. Um, 
uh, being here. And uh, I, I need to you'll read quick about this. Um, thank you for your great insights. Um, lots of thank yous, lots of kudos. Um, and um, uh, we always are uh, glad when we have new people. Um, and you know, what I always admonish you, bring one friend and we will double our um, uh, census. That's okay. right. Um, so there's a couple of, uh, some new names tonight. Thank you so much uh, for coming. Um, as um, I'm just getting, say something, Steve, while I get these uh, email addresses so I don't lose them. Okay, go ahead. Have you used any of those um, pre-order food sites? There, I can't think of the one name. Uh, as soon as the page comes up, it comes up keto, it comes up carnivore, it comes up vegan, vegetarian. You can pick yeah. and you can send. No, you know. no, but I, I, I'm working with a chef right now to start a meal plan for patients. Yeah, I think it'd be great for some doctors who are super busy and you don't have time to even cook, you know what I mean? <clears throat> yeah. Who, who are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Joseph, you, 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 didn't, you weren't raised to, to have tasty cakes for dessert every, every, every night? <laughs> um, fortunately... <laughs> No, I, I don't even know what those are, but okay. Well, it was, it's it's a Philadelphia thing. It was like it's sort of like a little Debbie's, but it's it was only in Philadelphia up until maybe ten or fifteen years ago, Debbie. and um, it was uh, uh, that we had chocolate cupcakes every every night for during the week. Um, they came three to a package in a wax, you know, in a wax um, uh, as a, in a um, yeah in a wax type of uh, package, and you either ripped it off quickly and the icing came off where you took it off slowly and then you got the icing on the cake. It was a, it was a, you know, a, um, a sort of a ritual. Uh, that was during the week, Monday, Monday to, um, uh, uh, Friday when, uh, uh, Saturday night, we had, uh, peat, peat butterscotch crimpets. Those were sort of like a yellow banana kind of thing. And on Sunday night was the big treat was peanut, peanut butter tandy cakes, which was, uh, sort of a, it could either be vanilla or chocolate snack cake with a layer of peanut butter on the inside and then chocolate on top. And you put it in the freezer and you take it out of the freezer. Um, and then so Steve Horvitz says butterscotch crimpets were the best. <laughs> Tasty cake. So, so yeah, I mean, it, 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 they kept it in the Philadelphia area. When I went to medical school in Iowa, my, my, my parents used to send me cases of it and they would be gone in an hour because everybody where we lived, everybody would be. Oh, 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 in, in our apartment building, uh, it would just be a tasty cake party. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's amazing that we even like, um, you know, gr actually our bodies actually grew up and matured when I think about, you know, <laughs> when I was thirsty, oh, Coca-Cola. Um, uh, oh yeah. You know, and, not, and not diet Coke. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, exactly. Like the real deal. Like, oh, you know, potato chips, I'm hungry. Uh, you know, it's like, uh, like I don't even remember eating real food, but um, yeah. Um, so something. So Steve Horvitz is on here. It says it says Philly native. Um, uh, I, I don't know if you're a Philly native. So Philadelphia soft pretzels, which are different than anything that you've ever seen before. But um, so you have to. They're, they're sort of a you know a doughy kind of kind of it, it, uh, much better than Aunt, Aunt Annie's or whatever that thing in the mall is. Um, but you had to get it on the. Um, so the road from where we lived in Northeast Philadelphia to downtown was called the Roosevelt Boulevard. It was a very revolutionary at the time. It, it was eight lanes, four each way with a, a, um, trees, dividers in between. And at the red lights, there would be kids standing there on the corner with these Philadelphia soft pretzels. And you had to get them between eight and 9 a.m. because that was just the right amount of road, road uh, schmutz was on it to give it the right flavor. <laughs> so huh. it's, <laughs> so that that was that that was, again that was another that was another philadelphia thing so yeah i was gonna say that's that's a yeah a little bit different world i i don't we didn't have any of that in, in michigan yeah. growing up so, and um no they didn't have any of that so um and uh and so um and then Steve says he, so I went to Des Moines. So Steve Corbin says he visited Des Moines Medical School for an interview and he, he brought taste cakes with him and they let him stay. They let to the person who he stayed with or something. So that's what I have. We, yeah. we, we, we would get cases of it. So I moved out here. When I moved out to Reno, 
there's actually a bakery that took them in, but they weren't selling very well. So I went in there and I told the lady exactly what to order. And I went back, a month, just... late. I went back a month later, she had tripled her sales in, in that wow. month. <laughs> so I had to get the right kinds. <laughs> Yeah, no, they sound they sound amazing, actually. So, and then Doctor Doctor Beverly, you graduated. So, I graduated from Des Moines, also. So, 1978. You can tell by the color of my hair. <laughs> so, um, okay, everybody. Um, oh well, it, it, we, we were close. <laughs> um, we probably crossed paths somewhere along the line. Then she graduated in 1979. Um, so, and we're still at it. So um, thank you all again for coming. Um, I got a couple of new names here. Uh, we'll get you on our uh, email list. Bring a friend. Uh, um, and um, uh, Steve said, you'll, you, you are Steve, are you in Philadelphia? Orbits? Um, you'll send me some if you give me 10% of Eagles, but I can get them in Reno now. They're, they're, it's, not, it's not exclusive anymore, <laughs> okay? Um, so, which was a big deal back when I was growing up, you could only get it in the Philadelphia area or Atlantic city, you know, down the shore, um, which is what we used to say. So, okay. Um, so the rest of you probably don't want to hear this bantering. Um, anybody have any questions, comments, if you have, um, if you have any topics you want to, want to present, um, you know, we can see we're, we're all, um, you know, it's a, we're all sort of a club. If you're not used to presenting, I mean, this is a good place to practice. Um, nobody's going to ch chop your head off or, you know, bite your head off and um, nobody's going to grade you badly. So um, if, you, if you're, if, you know, if you're, if you, you know, if you have something you want to present, um, we're more than happy to, to have you, um, um, you know, on. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we're all pretty supportive of each other here. Um, and uh, just to, to remind you that on Monday nights, Dr. Halas's group is, um, uh, you know, has a similar webinar. They have some different topics. On Wednesday nights, Dr. Farshian has the American Academy of Stem Cell Physicians. Um, they actually had me on two weeks ago. Um, so they, they, they have more topics than just re regenerative medicine. Um, and um, we're still, um, we haven't, um, we haven't uh, made any, any definitive arrangements, but we're, we're, we're kicking around I'm um, doing a, a, a live uh, a weekend, uh, three-day weekend, maybe in uh, late summer or early, early fall. Um, and um, believe it or not, we are still AMA certified. So uh, we can't we can do credits without partnering with anybody else. We're just not DO certified. So um, with that, Steve, thank you so much. Thank your father for being on. Everybody that's still on, um, uh, again, uh, last questions, comments complaints. Um, and um, uh, if nothing else, um, uh, we will remember AOSRD.org slash webinars. Um, we'll have the, the video on as soon as we can. And um, also, uh, usually within 24, 48 hours, we get the, uh, the uh, transcript on also. So Steve, thank you so much. We got you. We got you already scheduled for March 7th. Yeah. Um, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll take it from there. Okay. Good night, everybody. And have awesome. a great night. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Stefan.